This channel is part of the History Hit Network. This is a tale of two castles, which are built as part of a chain to protect London and which share a common heritage and a remarkably similar history. One is to the south of the capital and the other to the north. The castles were built by William the Conqueror for defensive reasons and were used by the Crown for centuries. Over time, their status has changed as lifestyles have altered. The castles at Guildford and here at Hartford may be a shadow of their former selves, yet there are still links between the Crown and these parts of the country even today. When William the Conqueror made London his capital, he designed an elaborate but effective defensive measure. Nine strategically important sites within a day's march of London were identified. Forts of varying sizes were built at each, of which Hartford and Guildford are just two examples. Hartford is the older. The castle was built near the site of a 10th century Saxon fort, next to the River Lee, at one of the few bridgeable points above the Thames. However, the village of Hartford had already entered the history books. In 673, the bishops of the five Saxon kingdoms of England met here in what became the first General Synod. It ultimately led to the domination of the Roman Christian Church over Celtic Christianity, which was a major factor in the unification of the country. Hartford Castle experienced many changes after it was originally built in 1070. Like Guildford, it was given up by the Crown during James I's reign, and in spite of being designed to defend London, neither castle actually suffered any military attack. Guildford was an original Norman keep, but it continued to serve to deter local rebellion long after the Norman invasion. Guildford was designed initially as a base for a band of horsemen. The position itself was chosen to dominate the Saxon town. When King John refused to acknowledge the Magna Carta in 1216, he plunged the country into civil war. The rebel barons invited Prince Louis, the Dauphin of France, to join their cause. Guildford was captured by the French after a 25-day siege. The feeling against King John was entirely personal, though, for as soon as he died and his nine-year-old son, Henry, succeeded, the barons changed sides and Louis and his army were booted out. However, the constitutional problems remained unresolved. Simon de Montfort, Henry III's brother-in-law, led a group of barons in a new bid to curb the power of the monarch, and they came to blows at the Battle of Lewis. At the battle, Prince Edward, Henry III's eldest son, challenged one of de Montfort's followers, Adam de Gurdon, to single combat. The two men fought, and Edward won. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. Adam de Gurdon was brought to Guildford Castle and thrown down at the feet of the king. Edward's wife, Eleanor of Castile, interceded on de Gurdon's behalf and he was duly pardoned. It's thought the whole event was staged to encourage other rebels to surrender. The repercussions of King John's actions and his reputation remain particularly evident in this part of the country. Not far from Guildford is St. Martha's Church, where Stephen Langton 
a leading critic of the king, is said to be buried. Langton was the Archbishop of Canterbury of the day and was largely responsible for focusing the barons' grievances against the king and creating the legal document which became known as the Magna Carta. The theory is that he's buried alongside a former abbess of St Catherine's. Nobody knows exactly why, although a local 19th century poet named Tupper built an elaborate tale around these gravestones, suggesting that she was his lover before he entered the priesthood. The author also used what was probably a well-known local legend to reinforce his image of King John. The story goes that John was out hunting near Shear when he came across Emma, the woodcutter's daughter, bathing in Silent Pool. He tried to have his wicked way with the girl, but she preferred to drown rather than submit to him. As the king rode off, her brother tried to rescue her, but also drowned in the attempt. Much of the land around Silent Pool in Shear is owned by the Bray family, who were given it by Henry VII after the Battle of Bosworth. When Richard was defeated, his crown rolled into the thorn bush, and it was Reginald Bray who picked the crown up out of the thorn bush, presented it to his master, Lord Stanley, who handed it to Henry VII, who was then proclaimed Henry VII King of England. I've always imagined that Reginald Bray was quite similar to the king himself, though he was considerably older. He was only two years younger than, than Henry's mother. So when, at the Battle of Bosworth, Henry was 28, Reginald was 40. But Cardinal Morton describes him as a man secret, sober and well-witted. I, I think he was. He was unshowy, he was unglamorous, he was absolutely loyal and trustworthy and honest and fair. He was appointed one of... Henry's chief counsellors, and he was made High Treasurer and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, which meant that he was um, one of Henry's principal financial administrators and property manager of all the Crown estates. Henry Tudor's reign was troubled, though, for when a rebellion in the North threatened the Crown, he raised a nationwide tax in order to protect his position. The men of Cornwall objected feeling that they were so far away from the border with Scotland, they shouldn't have to pay. And in 1497, they rebelled. Armed with pitchforks and handmade weapons, they marched on London. By the time they reached Guildford, the force totaled some 3,500 men. But a party of horsemen under the leadership of Darbley, the Lord Chamberlain, met them outside Guildford and a skirmish ensued. The rebels continued their march on London, but by now the King's forces were ready for them and they were completely overrun at Blackheath. Their leaders were captured and suffered the traditional sentence for treason. They were hanged, drawn and quartered. At the actual Battle of Blackheath, Reginald Bray was there. After the battle, when one of the chief leaders of the rebellion, Lord Audley, was executed, Reginald Bray was given the manor of Shear, which um, the lordship of the manor, which had previously been in the possession of Lord Audley. The estate mainly consists of cottages within the village of Shear, and also woodland, about 2,000 acres of woodland known as the Hurtwood, where Sir Reginald was given the right to, to ride and hunt and take beasts of chase. Because he died without children, he left money in his will for the completion of the building of the nave of St George's Chapel. So almost all that glorious building is partly, I think, a memorial to him. And you see the Bray Crest, which is a hemp bray, or flax breaker, repeated over a hundred times in the roof and in the, uh, in the walls and in the screens above some of the chantry chapels and in the doors, and, and I love it. <laughs> 
This stunning house and garden at Sutton Place near Guildford, like the Brave Farm, is another example of a gift from the Crown. It was given by Henry VIII to Richard Weston as a reward for his role in setting up the famous meeting of the French and English kings, known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. Weston was Henry's ambassador to the French court of Francis I. Sutton Place is one of the earliest Renaissance buildings in the country and was thought very avant-garde in its day. The gardens are spectacular, ranging from the sublime to the surreal, with traditional rose gardens, a theatre garden with its own stage, and an area paying homage to the artist Magritte. Henry's generosity to the Westons was mixed, however, for Richard Weston's son was executed by the king for allegedly casting an amorous eye over the queen, Anne Boleyn. Richard Weston named his son Francis after the French king. He grew up within the court and was a young man when Anne Boleyn rose to prominence. She thought highly of him and recommended him for a knighthood. But this close association with the queen led to his untimely death. When Henry decided to rid himself of his queen, he accused her of adultery with several courtiers, including Francis. The French king tried to save him, but Henry was determined to be free to marry Jane Seymour and to reduce the French faction in his court. This growing interest in foreign policy and external security meant that for castles like Guildford, their strategic importance in the eyes of the crown was beginning to wane, and with it, their use. Over time, Guildford was converted into the county jail for Surrey and Sussex until the 17th century. Since then, it has been allowed to fall into ruin, until today when it's used as pleasure gardens. While the incidents and circumstances may be different, the timing and the story is much the same at Hartford. A castle mot is the only surviving part of the original Norman fort, but in its day, this was a major royal palace. The most notorious resident was reputedly Edward II's wife, Queen Isabella. Such was her reputation that she was once described as the she-wolf of France, who terraced the bowels of thy mangled mate. The reason? While well, Edward and Isabella lived in the early 14th century, Edward II was a particularly inept and weak king. Soon after the disastrous battle of Bannockburn against the Scots, Isabella, in league with her lover Roger Mortimer, imprisoned the king, tortured him, and eventually had him murdered in the dungeons of Barclay Castle in 1327. They crowned her son, who was 14 years old, as Edward III. And for three years, um, Isabella and Mortimer virtually ran the country. She was also given the honor and castle of Hartford in perpetuity. But after that three-year period, to everyone's surprise, uh, the young king ordered Mortimer to be seized and thrown into the tower and he was tried by his peers and sent to the gallows. And obviously, in consequence of that, the Queen Mother lost her claim to Hartford Castle, and she was kept under constant surveillance until she eventually regained the favour of the King and was regranted Hartford Castle. And that was after four years in about 1331. It is said that uh, she ordered the heart of Edward II to be taken out and put in a silver box, which was then buried with her in the graveyard at Whitefriars in the city of London. And I understand it was placed on her chest when she was buried. And it is said that her ghost still haunts the graveyard until this day. <laughs> 
The castle at Hertford was used as a royal prison by Edward III when John, King of France, um, was defeated and captured at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. He was brought here and with all his entourage, but clearly the dungeon was not the place where he stayed. He brought with him 11 carriages full of all his possessions, and there were minstrels and courtiers and a jester. He also brought with him a prefabricated chapel with all its accoutrements and furnishings. And while he was here, he certainly was a popular figure, mainly due to his largesse. He spent £3,650 in four months, and that was when the average wage was £3 per year. Henry VIII was the last monarch to bring life and colour to the castle. He transformed it from a defensive fortress to a palace where his children spent much of their childhood. In fact, Prince Edward, his only son, was at Hartford when he heard of his father's death. He left the castle never to return. By the time of James I, both Hartford and Guildford castles had fallen out of use, at least in terms of the crown, and passed into private ownership. Nevertheless, both these parts of the country retained their associations in other ways. Hatfield House, not far from Hartford, was already becoming popular with Elizabeth I, while Guildford had to wait until the 19th century before it regained a personal connection. However, there is another intriguing similarity in these stories. Both developed schools as a direct result of royal influence. Hartford became the home of Christ's Hospital School for nearly 300 years. The original school, more commonly known as Bluecoats because of the uniform, actually started at Greyfriars in the city of London. At the school, there is a gateway with two figures of bluecoat boys. One is said to have murdered the other. One boy looks to the law courts and the other to the churchyard where he is buried. As the figures were erected in 1721, when the law courts were actually in the opposite direction of the guilty boy's gaze, it's unlikely that this romantic tale is true. What is true, however, is that Hartford is home to the oldest meeting house in the world for the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers. Opening a purpose-built meeting house was a brave move in 1670, for all such religious meetings were illegal. Just outside Esher, to the north of Guildford, is the Claremont Fancourt School. It's often referred to locally as the Forgotten Palace, for in the last century, Claremont was as famous as Balmoral or Sandringham are today. This magnificent Palladian mansion was originally built by Clive of India. He so intensely disliked the older house which was here that he had it completely demolished. Capability Brown designed this one, but sadly Clive never lived at Claremont. In a foretaste of the tragedy to come, in 1774 he committed suicide, leaving two small children and the house passed into public ownership. It subsequently became the home of Princess Charlotte and Prince Leopold. It is also the place about which it was once written, Poor, poor Clermont, what excesses of unhappiness and misery has it not witnessed? For Clermont was the scene of a tragedy that completely changed the fate of my family. The Princess Charlotte was the heiress apparent. She was the daughter of the Prince Regent. And Prince Leopold was a German prince, and he'd fought uh, as a cavalry commander in the Russian army against Napoleon. They had a very uh, wonderful time here. They were actually ecstatically happy for the 18 months before uh, her tragic death in 1817. Um, they um, really uh, had the opportunity to go to all sorts of dinners and balls and functions, both in London and Brighton, um, but went to very few and, and lived a very um, happy, almost retired life here, although they were quite young. She was 20 and he was 26. Um, and he was a passionate uh, botanist, so they would go out collecting flowers and grasses in the grounds. And they really um, kept clear of society. Certainly, when Charlotte was here, it, it was um, a very significant place. I mean, in, in some senses, you could say that the eyes of the world were on the house. 
um, because it was the home of the heiress apparent and people were sick of the excesses of, of the Prince Regent and the, and the Royal Dukes and they were longing for Princess Charlotte to come to the throne. Um, it was very definitely um, the centre of attention when Charlotte was about to, to give birth here. Things seemed to go along fairly well and the cabinet was summoned to Claremont to be present at the birth to certify that it was a genuine royal birth. The first part of the tragedy occurred on November the 5th, 1817, um, when she gave birth to a, a stillborn child. Um, but she seemed fairly healthy. And, um, but uh, things began to go downhill after that. And in the early hours of uh, November the 6th, 1817, she complained of not being able to breathe very well. And then she suffered from tremendous chest pains. And um, about 2.30 uh, that morning, um, she too died. And that was about five and a half hours after the birth of the stillborn infant. The effect on the country was, was, was electrifying. Um, people really felt that they'd lost um, a favorite, a favorite child. And there was enormous, enormous grief and, and the court went into a, an official period of mourning. The doctor who was attending the, uh, the princess, Sir Richard Croft, was so overwhelmed by what had happened, by his inability to preserve the life of the, of the heiress apparent, that uh, he committed suicide in uh, February 1818. The amazing thing about Leopold is that he stayed on at Claremont uh, after the funeral. In fact, he stayed on here till 1831 when he um, accepted the throne of Belgium. He had been offered the throne of Greece, but for some reason turned that down. And so he became the, uh, Leopold I, uh, King of the Belgians, in 1831. The succession died with Princess Charlotte on that tragic day at Clermont. And when her father, George IV, died, it passed to her uncle, King William IV, and eventually to her cousin, Victoria. Princess Victoria was very attached to Leopold. He was her beloved uncle. In fact, I think he sort of served the role as, as father. Um, seeing that uh, Princess Victoria had lost her father when she was about eight months old. So he was a dear, dear uncle. And um, she absolutely loved coming down from Kensington Palace here to, to, to live in his house and, and, and see him and, and talk to him. She always talked about this, uh, about Claremont as being the brightest epoch of her otherwise uh, rather melancholy childhood. So she was uh, tremendously fond of Claremont. She greeted her grandmother here when she was six and um, they got on tremendously well and uh, her grandmother said that she exhibited a staggering majesty. The future queen would stand expectantly on the top of the steps at the front of Clermont, waiting for the carriage to arrive. Some 20 years later, Clermont became the home of the new queen and her young family. But after Osborne House on the Isle of Wight was purchased, Clermont was used much less. Then Victoria gave it to her son, Leopold, also as a wedding present in 1882. The house passed out of Crown hands and became a school in 1931. The room in which those tragic events of November 1817 took place is now a history classroom. What's so fascinating about Hartford and Guildford is the similarity of their heritage and links with the Crown, yet their development has been entirely independent and shaped by utterly different circumstances. The stories of these two towns illustrate perfectly the constantly evolving pattern of life and therefore the changing relationship between the Crown and the country. In the story of Crown and Country, there are a few places that better illustrate the meeting of two themes than Hatfield House. 
Although only briefly used as a royal palace, it marks the period of change in royal living styles, from castle to house, which occurred in the 16th century. This was also the scene of one of the defining moments in the Crown's story, when, sitting under an oak tree in the park, Elizabeth I learned that her sister Mary had died, and she was now the Queen of England. Hatfield House today is nothing like the original Elizabeth knew, although there are still plenty of clues as to her time here. The house was largely rebuilt by Robert Cecil, the first Lord Salisbury, who was given Hatfield by James I. As a result, the only sovereign to have had a direct association with it is Elizabeth. Since then, several monarchs have stayed and been entertained here, but only as guests. As such, Hatfield has a peaceful, special, and very personal association with the Crown, unlike nearby St Albans. Over 500 years ago, the royal standard of Henry VI was raised here in the Market Square at the heart of St Albans. It was a signal which was to mark the outbreak of the War of the Roses and to thrust St Albans into the middle of the warring factions. The country was divided and in chaos. The king's opponents rallied to the cause of his warlike cousin, Edward, Duke of York. They were complaining, amongst other things, about the influence being exerted on the king by his counsellor, the Duke of Somerset. On May the 22nd, 1455, the Yorkist troops broke into St Albans, taking the king's army completely by surprise. The wounded King Henry was captured and the Lancastrians routed. As for the cause of all this trouble, the Duke of Somerset, well, he met his end through a most ironic twist of fate. A few years earlier, he consulted a soothsayer who told him he'd be killed near a castle. Fearing the prediction, the Duke stayed well away from Windsor on the occasions that he was invited by the King to attend there, and all other castles for that matter. But on the day of the battle, as the Yorkist troops occupied the streets of St Albans, he took refuge in a small inn, where he was found and put to the sword. The name of the tavern was the Castle Inn. It's long since disappeared, but this plaque shows where, in a way, the prophecy came true. A few years later, Henry's wife sought revenge. The tough and belligerent Queen Margaret of Anjou led the Lancastrian campaign, her first target was again St Albans. It is said that soft footsteps and muffled voices can still be heard in the early hours when Margaret and her forces crept into the town to launch a surprise attack on the enemy. The marketplace has been here for over a thousand years, but the name of St Albans and the reason the shrine are here are much older. The town and its cathedral are named after Alban, who was a citizen of the Roman city of Verulamium. He was a pagan who, in the early third century, gave shelter to a Christian priest on the run from his Roman persecutors. The fugitive's prayers and vigils so impressed Alban that he accepted the Christian faith, allowing the priest to baptize him. Alban then helped his visitor to escape by swapping cloaks with him. After the priest fled, Alban was himself arrested and brought before the town magistrates. Accused of being the priest, Alban played the part to the full, refusing to betray his new faith or acknowledge the Roman gods. He was condemned to death. He was led to the top of this hill, which was then on the outskirts of the Roman city, where he was beheaded. And so it was that Alban became the first English master. <laughs> 
His story began to spread, along with the legend that the executioner's eyes fell out as his sword struck. A church was subsequently built on the site, and during medieval times it began to flourish into a monastery and a center for learning. This was where the great chronicle of the 13th century was written and the first map of England drawn up. The old Roman city was effectively sidelined. St Albans grew and prospered with a town growing around the shrine. The nearby Verulamium was a rich source of building materials. The Romans, as you know, used tiles. We would call them tiles, but they were Roman bricks in their, in their buildings. And there were masses of them in, in Verulamium. And the Saxons had begun to bring a stockpile up. And, and when you look at the tower, you can see it's composed almost entirely of, of Roman bricks, uh, probably something like 5,000 tonnes of, of Roman bricks in the tower. By the time the abbey was dissolved by Henry VIII, the town was large enough to sustain itself. Indeed, in 1553, the townspeople, distraught at the state of their abbey, took matters into their own hands. The parish bought the church itself for £400. And unfortunately, over the years, they weren't up to maintaining it. And gradually, it fell into a state of disrepair. By the mid-19th century, the situation had become critical. The tower received emergency repairs in 1870 when a huge crack appeared in it, and other parts of the cathedral seemed in imminent danger of collapse. It was at this crucial moment that Lord Grinthorpe stepped in. Grinthorpe was a successful barrister who rather fancied himself as a bit of an architect. He told the diocese that he would repair the abbey at his expense, providing it was also to his own design. He totally rebuilt the Norman West Front in a Victorian Gothic style and remodelled the windows of the north and south transepts. The physical results can still be seen today, but he also added a new word to the English vocabulary. The verb to Grinthorpe, which remained in use until the turn of the century, meant to decorate lavishly and extensively, but without taste. In 1882, the government passed the Ancient Monuments Protection Act to prevent this sort of thing happening elsewhere. For centuries, the shrine to St Alban had been thought to hold magic powers to be a source of healing, so that the abbey has always been a destination for pilgrims. As the numbers of visitors to the shrine grew, so did the wealth and commerce in the surrounding area. One of the beneficiaries was the market. In spite of the wealth the abbey brought to St Albans, it also brought conflict. As so often was the case, the abbots were effectively the feudal landlords of the town and imposed a number of petty laws which the townspeople resented. For example, all the corn from the area had to be ground in the abbot's mill, at a price set by the abbot. The townspeople of St Albans attempted to gain greater control of their rights and freedom, and by building the curfew tower, they demonstrated that they could organise the town effectively. It was um, really looking the abbey right in the face, and it really established a symbol of their desire for independence. It showed that they could organise themselves. And it had a bell. Um, the bell was given the name Gabriel. But the point of the bell was it was uh, able to um, ring at 4 o'clock in the morning, which would wake the apprentices up. Uh, and also in the evening, uh, it rang the curfew. Got to remember that St Albans was largely composed of timber frame buildings. And so there was always the danger of fire, and so the practice was to cover the fire, cool for the fur. So the curfew was really aimed at the citizens putting their fire out. It wasn't a, an imposition that they had to be in their homes. So by contrast to the battles and conflict of St Albans, 
Hatfield has enjoyed a far more genteel history. Hatfield House was built by Cardinal Morton, Bishop of Ely and one of Henry VIII's ministers in about 1467. This is all that remains of that original house. When Henry VIII took over many of the possessions of the church, he claimed Hatfield for himself and used it chiefly as a residence for his children. Elizabeth spent most of the first 15 years of her life here, sheltered from court life. But after the death of her father, life became much more difficult for the princess. Elizabeth became the focus of suspicion when, aged just 15 years old, she was accused of having an affair with Thomas Seymour. Initially, both Elizabeth and Seymour were sent to the tower, but the princess was allowed to return to Hatfield to face an inquest. Elizabeth wrote this letter to her accusers, claiming that the alleged relationship was no more than an attempt to discredit her. Seymour, who had hoped to marry the princess and claim the throne for himself, met the same fate of so many who were condemned to a stay at the tower. Hatfield Palace had been given to her when Edward VI was on the throne, so it, it was her home. Um, there was music, there was dancing, there was riding, she was a very good horsewoman, and so it was a very, very nice existence, and now she was safe. She knew that um, there was no heir, Mary didn't produce a child, and she really was the obvious successor. Well, Mary resisted this for some time until in the end, in the last few weeks of her life, the council prevailed upon her. They said, you really have no option but to bring Elizabeth in on your death, and so she knew that she was relatively safe. When Mary died in 1558, Elizabeth heard the news of her accession while seated under an oak tree in the park. She immediately sent for William Cecil and appointed him her chief minister and he remained so for the rest of his life, and so inadvertently began a new chapter in the story of the former palace. At the end of the west wing, uh, near the west, west end of the long gallery, uh, in a cabinet, there's a hat, some stockings and some gloves. The gloves almost certainly were a pair of her gloves. She had very long, thin fingers. She was very proud of those hands. And in many of her portraits, you'll find her hands very elegantly displayed and she's invariably holding something in one of them. There are two portraits of Elizabeth. One is the ermine portrait, painted by Nicholas Hilliard, we think about 1585, and the other is the celebrated rainbow portrait. In the last 25 years or so of Elizabeth's life, she was obviously aging, but it wasn't um, felt that they wanted to present this aging process to the public, as it were. She had become by this time something of a cult figure and hers was one of the first portraits to hang in English homes, in fact. And so they really didn't want to show her as being ageing. And so they, they found a solution. They presented a sort of summarised version of her face, ageless, expressionless, blemish-free. And they bo bolstered it up, this up with all the, the symbols that appear in many of her portraits at this time. Um, there's a, a, an enormous rough round the back of her head and in, in the corner of that ruff is a jewelled knight's gauntlet. Uh, the pearls she is wearing, a symbol of purity and one of her favourite jewels. And on her left sleeve there is a serpent. Now that of course is a very old symbol of wisdom. And in the serpent's mouth, a ruby heart. And we guess that that might be telling us that she was also compassionate to a very great lady, but still very compassionate. Um, the fascinating thing about that particular portrait, of course, are the eyes and the ears which are painted over the skirt and the cloak which goes over her shoulder. Now again, we can only guess at what these are meant to tell us. We think perhaps they're telling us that she saw and heard everything that went on in her kingdom. Obviously a very extravagant claim, but the mystique, the majesty, the power was such that it was possible to believe that she did know everything. The rainbow portrait was painted in the year 1600 when she was 67, and she doesn't look a day over 35, so it's an example of, of the way they presented Elizabeth to the public. Elizabeth's successor, James I, did not care for Hatfield. He preferred Theobald's, the house of William Cecil, Elizabeth's advisor. 
The King proposed a swap, and Robert Cecil, William's son and now Chief Minister, was pretty much obliged to agree. And in 1608, three sides of the old palace were pulled down to create the present house. Although the Elizabethan palace has largely gone, a little of the character of that time remains in the gardens. This lovely knot garden is based on a typical Tudor design and was planted by the current owner, Lady Salisbury. Just along the River Lee from Hatfield is Brockett Hall. Although Elizabeth often used to walk here to visit, it only rose to prominence in the mid-19th century, and not always for the best reasons. Brockett Hall became the home of Lord Melbourne, who in 1832 became Prime Minister. It was Melbourne who, some five years later, brought the news to Princess Victoria that her uncle was dead and she was the new Queen. The Queen often visited Brockett Hall, and until her marriage, weekly bunches of flowers would be sent to her from here. However, there is another and not so well-known side to the story of this great statesman. His wife, Lady Caroline, was a charming and charismatic woman who seemed to entice everyone that she met, yet she flouted conventional behavior. Lady Caroline was very highly strung. In fact, so highly strung as the doctors thought, um, she was not actually given an education until she was 14 years old. She was very eccentric, she was full of energy, um, but at the same time this led to also to bouts of depression. And, uh, and so she had these, you know, she was known for these mood swings. On one occasion it's said that while the butler was laying out the table for dinner, Lady Caroline complained that the table lacked a proper focus whereupon suddenly scattering the ornaments, she climbed onto the table, striking a theatrical pose as a sort of living table decoration. Another occasion, in fact, when it is said by some that um, she had herself served up to her husband naked in a soup tureen, although um, I don't tend to believe too much in this story, as eccentric as she was, um, uh, vulgar she wasn't. Well, Byron, um, of course, was very celebrated after the publication of his first poem. And when they first met in London, he was a centre of attraction, but Caroline maintained her distance. And this interested Byron because he couldn't understand why she wasn't rushing to him like everyone else. And I think there was a great infatuation. It was like a, a volcanic eruption, their, their passionate affair, because he, he referred to Caroline his, as his little volcano. Um, their affair only lasted nine months, but it was such was its power and intensity that it really was to mark Caroline for the rest of her life. And poor Lord Melbourne, um, he just suffered in silence, but he surprisingly stood by his wife and remained loyal and supportive during this time. At the end of the nine months, um, when the affair ended, um, Caroline spent a short time in Ireland and then she returned to Brockett. Um, the, the, the pressure on the marriage became greater because although the affair had ended, um, Caroline got involved in many eccentric kind of things, and one of these things was, in fact, it was a cold December day, and um, Caroline, who was in very good terms with the uh, villagers of Brockett, invited over the village band and a number of young girls, and they took part in what you can only describe as a, as a bizarre ritual. Uh, she had a bonfire built uh, within the grounds of Brockett, and um, when the flames were lit, she, she cast into the flames copies of her letters of Byron and other various ornaments, whilst these young girls, now dressed in white, danced around the flames as the band played on. And um, she had one of her pages reciting lines of a poem, uh, which she'd written specially for the occasion. Well, in 1828, um, following another prolonged illness, um, she was taken to Melbourne House in London, where, in fact, it, it, the relatively young age of 43, she died of complete exhaustion. 
is said that a ghost still walks the stairs of, of Brockett Hall and can occasionally be seen in the, in the corridors and at the upstairs windows and occasionally even playing a sentimental air on the piano here in the morning room. Brockett Hall was not the only house to boast an eccentric lady at about this time. Lady Emily Mary Hill, who was married to James Cecil, the first Marquess of Salisbury, lived at Hatfield. Emily Mary Hill, um, she was the first Marchioness. She was born in 1750 and she was the daughter of the Irish Earl of Downshire. So she brought a lot of feisty Irish blood into the family. She gingered up the genes no end. Her husband was made the first Marquess uh, by George III. He was Lord Chamberlain to George III and so she became mistress of Hatfield House and she made her presence felt. She really did. In her 70s her husband died but she had no intention of retiring and becoming a, a dowdy dowager. She continued to carry on exactly as she'd lived before. She gambled. Um, she had Sunday card parties at the house, not the most appropriate day to hold a card party. And she loved riding. She was a very keen horsewoman. And she insisted on riding round the grounds when she was in her 80s. Well, by this time, of course, physically, she was a bit frail. And she didn't see too well either. And so, never mind, tie me on. And this is exactly what happened. They literally tied her onto the horse. And because she couldn't see too well, she'd be connected by a leading rein to a groom who was riding round with her. And when they came to a jump, he'd say, damn it, your ladyship, jump! And together they'd scramble over the jumps. One November evening in 1835, uh, the second Marquis and his wife were sitting quietly and there was a hammering on the door. The housekeeper burst in to say that smoke was pouring from Emily Mary's room. There were fire appliances from all round. They came from miles around, and one, in fact, from London, but they were unable to put out the fire. The wind was blowing in quite the wrong direction. It was fanning the flames further into the West Wing and the rest of the house. But fun fortunately, suddenly, the wind changed direction and started to blow the flames away, and so the house, the rest of the house was saved. There is a, a watercolour in the long gallery showing the damage. And of course, when they could get through to look for Emily Mary to see what had happened to her, they just found her remains and some pieces of metal, which they puzzled over for a while. And then remembering that she'd refused to give up the family jewels to her daughter-in-law, they realized that they were in fact the remains of the jewels and the remains of the star from her husband's Order of the Garter. And then they had another look and the story goes that they realized that they were fakes and then discovered sometime afterwards that she'd sold the real things to pay her gambling debts. So she really was quite a character, was Emily Mary. It was not the last time Sparks was seen in Hatfield, though. The third Marquis, Robert, is perhaps the most famous Salisbury. He was Prime Minister three times between 1885 and 1902. He was also responsible for introducing the telephone into the house and electric lighting. The only problem was that the naked wires on the ceiling of the long gallery were apt to burst into flames. The family, however, became quite accustomed to this and used to throw cushions to put out the flames, much to the consternation of their guests. The social connections with the royal family continue to this day. It's perhaps a reflection on the happier association the Crown has had with Hatfield compared with St Albans. Having been to both, I can honestly say there's nothing personal in such a view. It's merely based on history, and all that's in the past. <laughs>